Good morning to all. Welcome uh, to our webinar on cultural participation and local resilience uh, strategies for the recovery organized by the OECD together with the uh, European Commission DG Education and Culture, part of the uh, Creative Europe program. So today we have a session on uh, cultural participation and education. Uh, very exciting agenda ahead of us with uh, very interesting speakers. But maybe before we go into this session, um, I wanted to respond to some of the questions I keep receiving about uh, what are these members only sessions that we also have listed on the agenda. And in fact, these sessions are organized for our partner regions, because this project that we do together with the European Commission uh, involves a consortium, a group of uh, European cities and regions with whom we work, of course, around this uh, policy webinar is touching upon, upon cultural participation, cultural employment, business dynamics and creative sectors, and funding arts and culture. But we also go to each region to see what is happening there in terms of uh, the performance of the creative economy and also the policy framework to support this. Um, and we organize this uh, peer learning and exchange um, member, members only sessions <clears throat> during uh, our webinars, trying to create a community of practice and exchange to support uh, policy innovation. So if you would be interested to join this uh, group, uh, please feel free to contact me. But with this, let's uh, really start our session on cultural participation and education. And I'm very pleased to introduce and give the screen, the floor, I don't know what people say now, to my boss, Karen Maguire, Head of the Local Employment Skills and Social Innovation Division. Karen, please. So good morning or good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope many of you had an opportunity to participate in some of the other sessions where we've really covered a wide range of topics on uh, cultural participation and uh, measurement, inclusion, health and well-being, uh, and beyond. So today we're going to focus a bit more on the links between cultural participation and education and really try to get a, a sense for what is the evidence of these links, uh, what are the mechanisms by which they can mutually reinforce each other and also have positive uh, impacts on, um, on all aspects of local uh, economic and social development. Um, as you may know, this work is part of the uh, local employment and economic development program because we really view the importance of culture in this wide range of different policy areas, um, not only cultural policy, but but going well beyond into education policy, innovation policy, employment policy, uh, et cetera. So um, I just wanted to also, you know, this is also an area where uh, skills are really a critical part of the business models in the sector. Uh, and this is uh, something where Education also plays a role, uh, both formal education and also non-formal uh, activities and forms of education that we'll explore a little bit today. Uh, and also just with COVID, uh, we've seen both the education sectors and the culture sectors undergo massive experiments in digital uh, tools and the use of digital means. Um, and this is something where we think that there might also be some interesting uh, crossovers and synergies between the two and how both of them go forward in the way that they operate. Uh, and so there are some interesting opportunities to explore there. So um, first I'll just introduce our panel and then we'll just uh, jump right in. Uh, I also wanna flag that you know if you are thinking about questions or have an idea, wanna say something to a specific speaker, please feel free to use the chat function. And then as we get to the parts of more open discussion, uh, our different uh, participants can then uh, respond and make this as interactive as we can, despite being uh, behind the screens here. So let me first introduce Ava Antilla. Um, Ava is a professor in dance ped pedagogy um, at the Theater Academy of the University of the Arts in Helsinki. And she's also a, an author of a number of uh, books and reports that really hit at uh, interesting issues looking at social justice, embodied knowledge, learning and equality in, in, in arts education. So we look forward to hearing from you today. Uh, we also have uh, Juliana Chan Chao. Um, and Juliana has a wide ranging background as a cultural manager, curator, researcher and lecturer. Um, and you are very active in addressing live performing arts and really programming large international projects for cultural policies in Europe. Uh, and you're particularly in charge also of a cooperation called Be Spectactive, which we will hear a lot more about uh, later today. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, Stéphane Vincent Lancrin, uh, he's deputy head of the OECD Center for Educational Research and Innovation. Uh, and uh, you lead a number of projects, including work on the future of higher education. Uh, and you're also a, a co-leader of the work on uh, human capital and the OECD's innovation strategy and, and addressed a number of different areas in innovation and education and, and creativity. So we thank all three of you for joining us here today. Um, so I just start with a couple questions first for uh, Eva and Stefan. Um, so maybe uh, if both of you can take a, a little bit of a tack on what we know about the impact of cultural participation on education and learning and formal and informal uh, or non-formal forms of education. So Eva, we'll start with you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Or um, yes, it's 11 here in Finland, in Helsinki. It's 10 for you, many of you, but I don't know, you might be all over the globe. So whatever time it is for you, good day. And uh, very, Nice to be here and take part in this important webinar. And thank you for inviting me. It's um, it's a privilege to be able to talk about these very very important issues uh, with you. And um, there there is an there are a number of studies that confirm the significance of um, arts and cultural participation to more overall well-being, learning. Um, uh, being part of a, a, a citizen and throughout the entire life take part in society, societal activities as active member of the society. Um, and I'm not going to cite re, uh, studies here, they can be found, but one uh, problem of course is that many studies are inconclusive. As to, um, because it's not very easy to, to do research in this area. There are so many factors that play, play in this equation, come at play, and, and it's very hard to point out exactly what is, what is causing uh, the, the great uh, impact or the good, good uh, impact and the benefits of arts and cultural participation. So I would just say a little bit more generally um, by, by uh, somehow drawing from, from many, many, many studies, but also long experience as arts educator that I have from, from 1980s actually. Uh, and from also the point of view of from dance education a little bit. <laughs> from my um, viewpoint, I think the key to any kind of uh, positive impact or benefit to for children and young people and any person of any age is engagement, full engagement. The person needs to be fully engaged in whatever activity is taking place in order for uh, positive things to happen. And how do we get to that point where children use people, how, how do we get them engaged? I'm thinking about whole body or whole person engagement here, which is not only engaged intellectually or, or cognitively, and that also we should of course discuss uh, more uh, spe specifically what we, how we understand cognition nowadays, which is nowadays understood more broadly than before. Anyways, whole engagement, whole person engagement, it means that the person is engaged um, emotionally, also imagine the imagination or, or somehow the ability to imagine, it's not only like make-believe, ability to imagine is to see things that are not there, are not within your reach concretely or have not even been born yet or are not yet existing. So it's, it's more than uh, storytelling or, or make-believe. Uh, and I think that's the birth for creativity is this kind of ability to see something, see or, or feel or sense something that is not yet there or not now uh, there. 
Then another point is uh, sensory activation, multi-sensory activation, so that the whole body, whole person engagement is built also on, on all the senses that we have. We have much more, many senses that are not often being used in, in, for instance, in school education. We have, of course, sight and vision, which are the most uh, commonly used senses in education, but then we have uh, touch, of course, we have kinesthetic sense, and we have a number of proprioceptive senses that are, are within ourselves, within the body, that uh, somehow not are in full use in education, but in arts education, they often become uh, activated. And that's key to full engagement, one key. Uh, and often physical activity is one another key to, to engagement. At least it is a key for a teacher to see if pupils are engaged or not. If they do not actively uh, take part, for instance, in an activity. When we are sitting down by the desk, it's very hard for the teacher to, to decide or observe what is the level of engagement? A student can be very quiet and very um, seemingly uh, absorbed in a learning activity, but it also might be that she or he is not actively engaged in, in the learning. And finally, or oh, there are two more things that I think that are key to full engagement are um, aesthetic experience, uh, rich em environment and, and rich, kind of activities are key to aesthetics experiences. And these are experiences where perception, sensation, emotion, and imagination kind of come together. Uh, and yes, and finally environment, uh, rich environment uh, aesthetically and um, uh, so that there's a lot of possibilities for exploration, different kind of uh, materials, for instance, and so on. But the environment, environment also needs to be safe, both physically and psychologically safe, so that exploration is safe uh, in terms of not uh, ha uh, having any accidents, but also not making a uh, sensation for the student that they might make a fool out of themselves if they, they explore something and present something that is out of the ordinary. So there has to be uh, safety for uh, expressing original ideas, uh, opinions, expressions, cultural expressions that are out of the norm. So um, all of this uh, comes together as uh, full, ex full engagement that I think is a key to any kind of learning or, or benefit as, uh, and also um, now I, if I have one more minute, I say that uh, I think that these um, impacts or benefits can be uh, direct or indirect, which means that they can be directly measured or they will uh, provide some other or measured or observed, or they can have a longer term uh, impact, which might be in, in transfer areas, for instance, social skills and, and self-confidence and areas like this. But the key to full engagement then is, is that this activity, the student finds it meaningful. So that's another, another important element in this, this powerful cocktail that I just learned this uh, expression from a student who wrote about a powerful cocktail of ingredients that make, make uh, uh, good education. So thank you very much. That's some kind of a start for the discussion. Great, thanks, Ava. And I see a lot of links in what you were saying also with some of the discussions yesterday on uh, impacts on health and, and well-being, and also some of the challenges on thinking about uh, measurement. As you mentioned, sometimes the studies are not able to capture and it could be because of the way we're measuring, it could be because of the mechanisms. So um, so thank you for that, uh, that intro that, uh, uh, you know, as I think about the pedagogy that's for my, my own children, how they're being, uh, you know, how this is engaging their different senses and the creation, as you said, of that safe feeling of safe space, which for the inclusion element is, I think, uh, really critical as well. Uh, Stefan, do, what, what's your take on this uh, question? 
Well, first, thank you very much for inviting me. That's really a great pleasure to, to, to contribute to, to the discussion. So let me just start by echoing what uh, Eva said and, and first remind ourselves that cultural participation is actually a form of education. Uh, it's a form of learning already. So when we think about the impacts, well, it has an impact because we're learning when, when we're doing that. Uh, it's usually you know, non-formal learning, as you said in your intro. So even so part of it is pretty structured. You know, that's where people learn, for example, in, in sometimes you know, to, to perform instruments more than in schools. Uh, um, but it's a very important aspect. And actually, there is a lot of uh, uh, combination between formal and informal education on that, or non-formal education. So basically, you know, in science, it's when people go to uh, science museums, you cannot expect from a visit to a science museum to have a great learning outcomes because you know usually it takes more than a few hours to reach this kind of, of, of objective. But as Eva said, actually the engagement, the motivation, the interest in the topic can come from, from that. And so that's a very important aspect of uh, you know cultural participation and, and having a great environment. Uh, for that in any city, region, country, etc. Second thing I wanted to say is, uh, you know, the role of arts, education, and culture in the more formal aspect. And here, uh, you know, so there is connection with, you know, this uh, cultural participation. And in the other way, you know, why do we have arts education in school for different reasons? Uh, some of them are economic, you know, and, and actually we want to prepare people to be part of the cultural industry, the creative industry, and so people have to be prepared for that. And, and so there is all the skills preparation aspects of it. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, uh, another reason is just for cultural participation, you know, we want people to learn enough so that they can enjoy some of you know the music the arts that you know uh, people have are creating and that they can actually enjoy and participate in that you know design so that's really a second aspect another one which you know we can get into is actually for more general skills development you know it's uh, so what do we expect at first you know from any arts or cultural education is actually you learn whatever you are you know, so if you're doing dance, what I would expect first is that I can dance at the end of the day, you know, and, and if I'm, you know, uh, learning music, what you would expect is that, you know, we understand or we can play music or we can compose music or we can do something, etc. So I think we have to keep that in mind. Actually, the first objective is for us to learn some of these um, knowledge, cultural expression that we human beings like, you know, and, and, and that we, and which is part of our life and, and which is part of all the society that, that, that we know. But of course, there is also kind of a more general aspect to it. And, and a lot of the research, so here I'm going to talk about some, um, you know, in terms of evidence, a book that we have uh, published a few years ago, which is called Arts for Art's Sake, question mark, you know, so, I would say, you know, the first reason is actually, yes, it's art for the arts, but obviously, you know, especially working at the OECD, we like when things are more transversal and have some kind of um, collateral benefits. Uh, and so there is a question of how, what are the kinds of other skills that you can build when, when you do that? So there is a lot of, uh, in a sense, a strange research on, on arts education and cultural education on what is the impact on a lot of the outcome that we find very important in, in education, you know, like uh, mathematics, science, uh, reading and, and, and variable skills, etc. Uh, and actually there, there is some uh, uh, strong evidence of causal impact, in fact, in these areas, what the strongest one is for a drama education. So basically, when people learn to, to read, uh, they understand much better, they can read much better when actually they enact uh, the text that they are uh, reading in class. That's very, it's not, a, it's surprisingly, it's not a very commonly used uh, pedagogy uh, in, in many OECD countries, but it's probably one of the strongest 
uh, result that you find over and over again. And all this has been done with uh, experimental studies, so with a very strong uh, uh, causal uh, implication. The other domain where we have a lot of, of evidence is about music education. Uh, and why? Because in fact, you have uh, probably four times as much research on music education than any other of the arts. Uh, um, and actually it shows that you have uh, a causal impact on achievement, even on IQ actually. And why? It's actually difficult to understand because in, in reality it doesn't make a lot of sense to think about it when you think about it. Uh, but probably the mediator of that is conscientiousness, you know, is that in fact you, the discipline that you get, all these studies, usually when I say music, we're talking about classical music, uh, and which is, you know, we don't know if when you learn to play uh, some pop music in your garage, you have the same kind of effect. That has not been studied, you know, that's, uh, uh, and so there is this aspect, all these, all the skills that actually you, you learn and that then you apply to uh, other areas. There are a few other things like, you know, in the case of music, it's, it has a very strong impact on, on verbal skills, just because, you know, you have better phonological awareness. Uh, you hear, you know, it has an impact on foreign languages because you hear bit better the accents, etc. you know. So, but all this is really close transfer, you know, it's just that when you're learning music, you know, you're just training your ear to listen. And so that has a close transfer into another field, which is very close, which is actually uh, uh, listening to people, you know, the, and, and, and reading and all the verbalization that goes with it. So this is really the type of uh, thing that we have. And in terms of evidence, what we know is that usually you have only a close transfer when it comes to cognitive skills. So that, for example, many people think that uh, mathematics education, uh, that music education has a link with math education. Uh, and it's not true, you know, there is no evidence, there is no strong evidence showing that if you learn music, you're better at mathematics. Even so, you know, it happens that mathematicians like music or musicians may like mathematics, but that's just correlational, you know, that's not, uh, we, we don't have much evidence uh, of that. What's interesting for us, uh, you know, when we're talk thinking about the economy, uh, the society, you know, and, and so innovation, uh, digitalization and all this future skills need is to what extent, you know, um, um, arts education and cultural education can actually lead to the development of higher order skills like creativity, critical thinking, uh, social and emotional skills, like, you know, communication, collaboration, etc. Uh, and there is some evidence on that, but which is pretty limited. That has not been the focus of a lot of the research uh, uh, on that. But this is really something that is very important right now and where I believe cultural participation and, and cultural education, be it formal and non-formal, actually uh, can have a, a very strong impact in, in terms of uh, skills development. So perhaps I stop here, I have, I, or the, you know, I have a few more things to say, but um, it can come later. Great, thanks Stefan for outlining some of these areas where we do have some clear evidence and some other uh, myth busters that you've uh, highlighted on this, uh, some of these links that maybe people think are there, but maybe the evidence really isn't. So, um, so I, another question to both of you um, is really about, uh, you know, what are the different trends and opportunities brought about by the current crisis um, for cultural participation and education? And I know, you know, the, the note that, uh, uh, the our team did on uh, culture and the impact on um, uh, the culture and creative sectors was uh, had a focus particularly on these digital angles, but there could be all sorts of other other issues. And um, so I'd be interested to hear Ava what you think about uh, how the how this uh, um, pandemic has has maybe spurred some innovations in how you deliver uh, you know your classes, but just in general in the in the sector. Yes, it, it, it really has been a challenge, but um, at least uh, arts educators who I know of and who I work with and my students at UniArts, I think it's, it's this kind of uh, creative um, skill already at play here when um, 
we face challenges actually in my field uh, in dance education at least and dance art we constantly uh, face challenges it's it's the <laughs> it's always there <laughs> because we are very much underfunded and very much um, marginalized uh, sector in in cultural field but um, beyond that i think also uh, more um, uh, prominent art uh, fields the the parties the the persons working there they also have this this kind of attitude to challenges that they are there to be tackled and challenges are part of art we we deal with we deal with challenges in art um, it's it's the material for for creativity there has to be some kind of 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 um, something that we work with or with at least not against always but something that is is somehow making us uh, really fully engaged as i it's kind of connecting to the the previous um uh question in that that um there's the physical world most often that artists work with like physical materials how do i bend this material how do i bend my body how do i make this this painting for whatever to to somehow represent my inner image of what I want to say. So there's always this kind of um, work, very physical kind of work going on. This challenge, however, is a little bit different because it's not about the physical world. It's it's about how do I how do I reach uh, the other person or my students or the audience through through this um, virtual media how do i how do i feel that the people are being touched or they are engaged on the other side or wh wherever they are like now as we are here speaking how do we get this um, feeling that we are so doing something together if, that we are sharing something so that's that is another other kind of challenge that is is new in this situation. Of course, there has been media art and all kinds of uh, digital uh, platforms before, but of course now it's different because we are we have to do it. We it's not by choice. It's because we we are forced in a way to to learn and and use media or, or tools that we have we would not otherwise use. So. Um, Yes, it's it's been a challenge, and I myself personally, I I was taking part in several cultural activities via uh, via the screen uh, in the spring, but now I'm not so much anymore. It's it's kind of there's some limit to to how long and how much we can spend time by the computer, and uh, I don't know. Uh, the general public, but at least arts educators, artists, and dancers, especially, are very conscious about the the body and the effects of of sitting by the screen on the body, because uh, we constantly um, feel that we we have to be active somehow. The active active um, physically physical activities is really part of art making and and. Um, it's it's been difficult. It's been very difficult, and um, somehow teachers, educators have learned to to activate, to engage, to give classes online, to do artworks uh, that activate the uh, audience. Uh, it's it's happening fast, surprisingly fast. And as an example, uh, I was telling before we started. Uh, that I had um, a last class yesterday with my uh, master students in dance education, and they were uh, presenting their solos, dance solos. And um, uh, half of them uh, were at home or not present, but they presented their work uh, online. And half, because then we had a so so smaller group, we were able to meet in person in in a studio space but we were all there together somehow and the video works that uh, some of uh, half of my students created were actually wonderful video works works video so solo dances 
and uh, we were just wondering how how quickly they have taken charge of this medium and and it was it was really really great that they had made uh, this challenge an opportunity and and they had learned something new and also they were able to follow the, the others presentations and performances through the screen so lots of challenges but lots of spaces for learning too Great, thanks, Eva. And I, personally, I'm not an expert on this, but I know that there are different ways of digital monitoring of, of areas of engagement. But uh, maybe not all of us want <laughs> want our, our computer screens to tell to tell everybody that. Um, Stefan, um, I'll, I'll pose to you the same question. Also, uh, I see in the um, the Q and A here, there's another question that might be particularly interesting for you to address if you can in your answer, and which is um, if there are educational toolkits um, using to overcome the digital divide and how uh, Corona um, has changed that. And then, you know, later, Ava, if you have some comments, we can. Uh, we can address that as well. So, so Stefan, uh, trends and opportunities brought by the crisis. Yeah, so let, let, let's start with uh, actually the challenging trends, and then hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll see if there is some um, light as well uh, as part of the crisis. But I think that you know the, the two sectors, cultural um, participation or cultural institutions and, and education schools, have faced similar challenges. I would say that it's been worse for the cultural sector than uh, for schools, but many of the challenges are very similar so you know this question just raised one of the big difficulties you know uh, so when schools had to close this mean that you know you have a lot of well, first a differentiated impact on different types of learners and that's true in cultural education as well as uh, in education so basically uh, it's much more difficult for the youngsters you know uh, the younger you are the less autonomous you are the less your Zoom class is going to make a huge difference to, to you or that you will have the autonomy to actually learn. And that's exactly the same problem. I can see with uh, children which are very close to me that uh, thank God they have a certain age and which allows them to take their instrument class by Zoom. Uh, but you know, if they were just starting their instrument, it would be much more difficult. And that's true. So it's really very much a lot of similar challenges. I would say that obviously in the case of, of cultural institutions and culture, the shock has been greater than education. It has been as big in education at the beginning where you have all the school closures, but now in many countries, uh, uh, schools have reopened in some way, hybrid or, or just reopened, you know, and so with a lot of the distanciation, et cetera. And so things have, you know, been able to, 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 to resume, which is not necessarily the case in, in, in uh, for the cultural uh, institution. So that raises a big question of uh, uh, why actually have governments this time in this, for the second wave tried to, to reopen is because of all these inequity problems, the difficulty to get people engaged at a distance, you know, and to keep people engaged and, and the fact that the, the fear that they're going to be uh, an increase, you know, in the achievement gap in what people uh, are, are, are doing. I would say another aspect um, is that in that closure, actually arts education and cultural education have suffered probably more than many other subjects which are taught in school. Uh, you know, that's not where the, the biggest emphasis have arguably been put on. But on the other hand, we could see in many countries that uh, a lot of interventions to um, work on the social and emotional skills of, of students have been actually done through the arts. And so that in fact, cultural and arts you know, have actually played a role in terms of addressing people's well-being. Because one of the big things we've seen for sure, and that we already seen the statistics, is how actually the uh, lockdowns in, in the countries where we have the stats, you know, show that uh, people's anxiety, stress, and happiness have unambiguously improved, you know, compared to the previous uh, period. So that was a, a that was a tough time for uh, for most people, and and. So it's good that in some ways, uh, you know, arts could play a role. But that leads me to the, 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 the opportunities. And I think that's actually where we have the opportunities. Uh, you know, there is always something perhaps bad, com uh, good something coming out of, of a tough or bad situation. And one of it is that we have actually realized that, um, well, 
perhaps we need to reconsider what is important in life, you know, that, uh, that we, uh, one thing that actually is probably something that I had never seen in my life before is uh, that suddenly the economy was not the most important thing. And actually we collectively as a society have prioritized something other than actually, you know, uh, what used to be the, the, the normal logic, in fact, you know, so the health of people, you know, uh, uh, the well-being, etc. And so actually that's what I see as a, a big opportunity coming out of, of the crisis. And actually this need, you know, this experience of um, the importance of socialization. So that's also one of the reasons why schools have reopened. You know, we have um, we know that we want people to learn something in school, and so we at the OECD, you know, we monitor the learning outcomes of people, and if, and actually now we broaden them to a lot of different types of outcomes, you know, social and emotional skills, and and, and you know, um, creativity and, and critical thinking, etc. Uh, but we know that's important. But in fact, what was missing during the crisis was um, the school as a social institution. A school, you know, the school as a place where people could, could actually socialize. And here, I think that's one of the big opportunities for uh, cultural participation and, and for arts uh, education, you know, because uh, Eva mentioned, you know, the solo dances and that you can play music by yourself, you know, you can write a book by yourself, you can do visual arts by yourself, but there are a lot of things that actually you socialize in, you know, so uh, arts. And culture is also one way to, to socialize. Uh, and so, you know, you, you dance with other people in many cases, actually, you know, you, when you do drama, it's, uh, you have a, an audience and you have actually a group of people who, who, who do that or see so Music, most of the time is actually also done collectively. It's done as something for other people as well, you know, and, and movies and even games, you know, is, uh, and, and which, are part of the creative industries are uh, really one of these. So I think that, you know, this importance of well-being, socialization, etc., is really one of, uh, and the need for that and the recognition that we now have of the need for that is what I see as really one of the big opportunities uh, uh, of the crisis. Now we have the question of digitalization, so, and, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen after that. And, and I don't know exactly whether it's an opportunity or a challenge. Uh, it's certainly both, you know, and, and if, we, if you think of education and if you think of arts education, probably, well, we are not, and I hope we are not actually, uh, you know, going to go back exactly to the same format as we had before, you know, digital tools and resources will be much more uh, present. We've been aware that there was not necessarily enough or that there were many that we didn't know existed before the crisis. And I think that this is going to be uh, so we're going to continue in some ways with probably more digital uh, aspects. If cultural, the cultural sector and creative sector have digitized a lot uh, in the past, uh, you know, as, as an economic sector, let's put it that way. Uh, cultural participation and education to a lesser extent, perhaps. And there is a real question of what can be done in this area that is meaningful through these different you know, ways, you know, can we actually use digital tools in a, in a way that will, you know, make it more perhaps uh, uh, democratic, or that will make a lot of things that were not accessible to people more accessible. Uh, are we going to change our ways of uh, learning and teaching thanks to that? You know, and for example, in the case of, of um, uh, some of the um, uh, arts education that is taught in school, which is mainly music and and, and visual arts. Um, you know, are we going to embrace this uh, digital composing, this uh, digital writing? I don't know, you know, so, but there are a lot of new possibilities that open and, and I hope that those will also be explored uh, after the crisis. Great, thanks Stefan. And I, I think, uh, you know, one of these key points that is often not something we talk about necessarily at OECD conferences, but these issue of values uh, that you raised was very interesting and also, uh, it's something where the recognition that you said that uh, the culture sector has such a critical role in well-being uh, as well and cultural participation having a role in that. Um, and this is something that is also a window of opportunity for our different policies to try and better understand all of these uh, 
all of these positive benefits associated with culture um, in a way that maybe they didn't uh, before the crisis fully recognize. So, um, well, that really flew by. I was, uh, so we've gone uh, a little past our 25 minutes, but um, we're gonna next now switch to a couple of presentations by uh, Stefan and um, Juliana. And uh, we'll keep, I see there are a couple of, there are a few questions and uh, comments here in the Q&A uh, session. And so after the presentations, we'll uh, be able to go through those more thoroughly. So um, Stefan, I think we're going to start with you to give a little bit of a, an overview on some uh, OECD work on creativity and uh, critical thinking from some uh, research that's been done. So look forward to the presentation. Thank you. So thank you very much. So yes, I'm going to present one of you know the ongoing projects that, that we have uh, at the Center for Educational Research and Innovation and actually talk more about uh, the, what we've done uh, in terms of um, schooling at this stage. So basically, you know, we've done some work in primary and secondary education and we are continuing this work right now uh, in higher education uh, so that it's, it's work in progress, but we already have some results. So next. So while the idea of it, you know, it really comes from, uh, you know, as I say, we work at the OECD and the E stands for economic, so that, you know, we're interested in what are the actually future skills needs. And here I'm just showing one uh, of the different sources that show the importance of creativity, critical thinking. I could show some other examples, you know, coming from different uh, uh, employee surveys in terms of, you know, who, uh, what are the skills that people use when they innovate or, um, you know, and a lot of different sources showing that actually, uh, you know, these higher order skills are getting more and more important. I would say one, because they are part of the innovation skills. And we know that uh, for in some economies, we need a lot of the economic growth is driven by innovation. You know, let's say that, uh, uh, the economies of scale don't necessarily work everywhere uh, as uh, you know, and so that's important. And the second aspect is just the digitalization that is coming. And so, you know, this idea, whether it's true or not, you know, but that uh, with the um, mainstreaming of, of, or the coming mainstreaming of AI, robotics, etc., we will have to focus on things which are today at least much more difficult to automate. And therefore that, you know, we have to go through things which are much more complex, human, et cetera. And so there is this bigger emphasis, which we find more or less uh, uh, in all uh, a curricula across OECD countries, and I would even say uh, across the world. Next. So what we, one way to think about this, you know, in terms of what are the future skills that we need to, to, to foster and, and, you know, we, we we, we, we think of it, you know, at the OECD in terms of uh, knowledge, skills, and attitude. So here I'm really focusing on technical skills and which I, you know, which is basically uh, uh, the know-how and <clears throat> the know-what in all the different domains. We have the importance of social and emotional skills, uh, you know, which we know are key for entrepreneurship, uh, but also just to, you know, have a, a good life, you know, and, and then these, higher order skills, which are cognitive skills, but uh, you know, which uh, look at things in, in a more different way, which overlap with all the other ones, but are not quite the same. Uh, you know, basically you can be very good at, let's say, uh, music without a very creative musician. Uh, you know, that's, uh, so that's the difference between the two. And that's true in, in, in any possible domain. So the big question was, given that all these different things were included in all the curricula and that there was no particular opposition uh, against them is why is it not really happening? So what, uh, and one reason why, you know, our diagnosis of why this was not really happening in the field is um, that people didn't quite know how to do it, uh, you know? So what, it's not very clear what this means. And I remember once I was asked by someone and someone told me, oh, I fully agree with you, Stefan, with all of what you're saying, but just tell me what it means to be a creative uh, in primary education in mathematics. And then I will, I'm, I'm going to write a textbook for you. And so that was a good challenge. And actually that's in some ways why we started uh, uh, this field. We didn't stick to mathematics. We, we also worked on arts, uh, science and, and some other aspects of it. Next. So what, what we did was to answer this question, uh, was really trying to so understand what we're talking about. So articulate a common language internationally, uh, 
develop examples of, so what does it mean to develop creativity and critical thinking in different domains as part of the subjects, acknowledging that what we ask teachers is to teach a certain curriculum. Uh, and so that, you know, they have all this content knowledge that they want to push through. And so the question is, how do you make space to do that? Third question is, how do you accompany people uh, to do it? And so what kind of professional development or professional learning opportunity you should give them so for that to happen? Uh, and finally, you know, we always tell people at the OECD that you should evaluate what you do. So we thought, let's try to do that. And so we have also developed uh, evaluation instrument that uh, countries can use uh, if they want to do an efficacy study of what they've been doing. So instrument that work for a quasi experimental uh, uh, with a quasi experimental design if they want to evaluate uh, what, what they were doing. So we've tested all these uh, next. We've worked in, in, uh, with many people, uh, you know, in uh, different countries, actually, which were very different. We did field work so that actually all the things that we have developed were co-designed through proto a quick prototyping method, uh, working with teachers in schools during two school years in all these different countries. Uh, so 11 countries and many teachers, students, and, and at both primary and secondary level and in five different uh, uh, disciplines. Next. And so what we've come up with is to work with uh, rubrics. That is a way to simplify what we're talking about and to make it meaningful in a school context. So what are the things that people should be focusing on if they want to leave this space? So here we have developed a portfolio of rubrics and so we have more or less complex. We have some which are for specific uh, disciplines, but basically the, the general idea was that, you know, you have to do two things in develop inquiring, imagining, doing, reflecting. And which means not exactly the same thing if you're talking about creativity uh, and critical thinking. And that you can do in all the different domains that uh, you are doing. It doesn't mean exactly the same thing because all this creativity, both creativity and critical thinking are domain specific, which means that they manifest themselves in different ways in different domains. Uh, but that's more or less uh, the general ideas. Next. Initially, we were a bit naive. We saw that um, once we have the rubric, everything will go fine because we have the language. So, uh, and then we realized that, in fact, across all the different countries, the way they interpreted these things were, was quite different. And so, thank God, we were asking them to show us what you're doing. And we collected and developed a lot of uh, lesson plans. And then we have realized that actually, a language is not enough. You need examples of it, and you need to have a variety of resources and scaffolding resources to, to, to make it happen. Uh, so we had to develop other tools. Uh, we developed this bank of pedagogical resources um, and also different types of criteria that are very important. Because what we ask people is, when you prepare your lesson, you have to make sure that you know when you're trying to develop the different aspects of the rubric I showed you before. But, you know, worked totally and so because of that you know we really had to multiply the tools including these two nice comics that we have actually commissioned uh, to, to a comic artist next so one of these things i believe is interesting for cultural uh, um, institutions uh, because i think it works probably the same way uh, for formal education and non-formal education and one of the big, the big problem initially is the question of engagement, you know, and so how do you create students' interest to learn or need to learn? Uh, in some cases, you know, you have uh, uh, arts can be better, but not always, you know, if you think very well about it, you know, in some cases people get bored, you know, they don't want to go to their music class or they don't want to go to their visual arts class, you know, that's, uh, so it's not necessarily something which is intrinsic to the domain, you know, it's really how you connect it to the interest of, of, of the learner. And usually, you know, so one way, for example, is to start with philosophical questions, something that teachers are reluctant to do because they find out, oh, these questions are too difficult for children. But it happens that these are the questions that the children like the most, you know, they, they, they don't have the answer, but that makes a very interesting start. What we find in some of the lessons we've seen coming back from the field as well is that they were just too simple. Uh, and so if what you have to learn is not challenging enough, then actually you're not going to get people engaged and they're not going to be interested. Of course, if it's too challenging, it doesn't work either, you know, then they get demotivated. But so finding this right level is a very important uh, aspect. 
Third thing which is important is actually to have to be clear about your learning outcomes and to be clear that your what is the technical knowledge you're developing and that's true you know so if you want to develop creativity um, you know uh, uh, let's say music or visual arts you know you still have to learn something about music and visual arts you know so if at the end of the day you feel like oh I just learned creativity but I don't I cannot do anything in, in this domain then that's problematic as well and this is also what we so sometimes so there was a kind of disjunction between the creative uh, aspect and and, and the, the subject one uh, and finally it's really be sure that you're not just working for tests you know but actually you're doing something you know that you are developing and when we call what we call a product here is um, an essay a performance a presentation anything, an artifact, you know, and so that's a very important that when you learn something, it actually gets to something which is not just, I take an exam and I get a mark and then I move on to the next one. Uh, next. Then there was another set of criteria which are actually more challenging for teachers usually. Uh, one is actually to let the students co-design part of the product. So what we've seen in some cases is that uh, one way to get creativity is to ask everyone to do exactly the same thing and then actually you look at all the products and in some cases that may be creativity needed you know if you if everyone writes a let's say a sonnet for example you know so there will be some similarities uh, obviously you know because you have constraints when you, you want to to do these things but in many cases uh, one way to leave the room to develop these things is to actually allow the the learners to co-design part of the problem or the solution uh, that's a very important uh, uh, aspect of it. And also, of course, to choose your task properly, you know, so that you have to choose data that can be looked at from different perspectives. So you cannot do it for everything, but you have to think of when you can actually uh, do that. Which means that as a teacher, you may end up in something that you haven't planned before. And that's one of the big difficulties. You know, you have to be in a position where you don't know what the answer is, or you have... Uh, or it goes in the direction that you hadn't planned, you know, but that's not a problem. Uh, and that's really one of the things which is very challenging for many of, of the teachers, actually. Then, of course, including space and time for reflection is another one that we should apply to ourselves in many cases, you know, because there is always no time. We just have to move on to the next things. And so all these criteria are very important ones to actually create the room for creativity and critical thinking. Uh, and they work in any domain. One very important message we have in this project is that uh, you don't have domains which are more associated to creativity or critical thinking than others. So it's not because you're doing cultural education or arts education that is going to be more creative or that you're going to, not because you're doing science, that you're going to develop more your critical thinking. Actually, even philosophy, sometimes you don't even, you know, develop your critical thinking so much, you're just learning it in a dogmatic way, you know, and then you, you just learn what is supposed to be learned and, and, and that it. So it's very important that these things are done intentionally with a, in a structured way in some ways. And really that's what we, we've shown that you can, it's possible to do, many teachers have done it, and that actually then you can get some of the results. Next. And that's just, I think that the next one is, should be my, Oh, yeah. So we have, uh, that's, that's the advertisement. Uh, so if you want to know more, you know, we have, we, we already have a book on that. And where basically what we've done is develop a method, you know, which can apply to other skills and creativity and critical thinking. But, you know, you, we could do, perhaps we'll do, you know, another project on collaboration and communication, and we could actually review some of this method for uh, the same thing. Next. We are going to have also very soon, so still the advertisement part, you know, a bank of pedagogical resources, including cultural resources, which will be made available to all the people interested. And that we hope can be expanded to something, you know, also to informal uh, education and cultural uh, education. So it's going to come out early next year. We are working on the last security aspects of it. So let's hope that we get uh, uh, all these things fixed very soon. And next. And so basically, that's really what my final point, you know. Uh, we're, we're continuing this work. Uh, 
it's very important to improve the quality of our education. So whether it's formal and non-formal, and we can do actually these things by working on the pedagogies, being much more intentional in what uh, we're doing. And so that we reach much uh, higher levels of quality and develop the skills that you know, people will like uh, as part of their future. And the good news in the case of creativity and critical thinking, so it's even truer for creativity, is that not only it's good for the economy, but it's good for people's well-being because a lot of evidence shows that this is what we as human beings like to do and it makes us happy. So let's continue to work on that. And if you want more information, you have my info on the next slide, I believe. Thank you very much. Great, thanks to Stefan. And I think uh, we'll just scroll to the next slide real quick so we get that up there uh, with his um, with his contact information if anyone wants to note it. Um, Benedetta, feel free to scroll to the next slide. Um, and so um, this, uh, so it's very interesting, Stefan. Also, I just note, um, uh, I guess, we're having a little uh, technical trouble, so we'll get there uh, in a minute. But uh, um, I also found very interesting that actually your presentation included um, also visual arts in order to better engage and communicate, which I thought was really, uh, really interesting, unusual for a PowerPoint presentation. We see how just a flat bullet point is maybe a lot less effective at engage engagement as uh, you know, images and a story. So um, thanks for putting that into practice directly in your presentation. So um, next we're gonna have uh, Juliana Chanchao who uh, helps lead a, a really a large scale uh, uh, international cultural program, Be Spectactive. And uh, I think their engagement is probably at the core. So Juliana, the floor is yours so uh, we can all learn more about it. And I just remind everybody that if you have any questions that you're thinking about, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. And then after Juliana's presentation, everyone will be able to pick up on your questions. So thanks Juliana for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much Karen. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be part of this uh, beautiful panel and uh, this beautiful occasion. So yeah, thank you. Bispet Active is, um, as you were mentioning, uh, is a large scale cooperation project and uh, we started in 2014. So the interesting thing is that we really started at the beginning of the big adventure of the audience development. So let's say that now actually we are in the second edition, in the middle of the second edition. So already six years already are already uh, done. So uh, uh, part of our experience. And um, and uh, yeah, the, the the topic of the engagement and then cultural participation in the performing arts is uh, is crucial. And really, in the light of engagement, we have built progressively all the structure and uh, the architecture of our project. So, uh, since the beginning, the project was uh, focused on uh, let's say three main elements that you will. Uh, uh, see step by step in the, the description of the project. So, firstly, on the role of um, active spectators, uh, so citizens that actively uh, participate in all the different activities part of our program. Secondly, um, one of our aims was um, and still is to assess a qualitative process in a translocal dimension, as I like to define it. Uh, through uh, the production of artistic works, because we produce a lot. And um, the second aspect is the research. So a research process which aims to observe and then at the same time to introduce in itinere the findings uh, that, are, that are good. So I will be more precise about uh, these three aspects uh, step by step in, uh, in my presentation. So. Uh, for arriving to the topic of education, I would like just to give you um, an idea of how we have built our project and then for arriving to um, uh, our informal approach to education. So here I would like to yeah, bring two main uh, concepts that arrive from uh, Eva and Stefan. So the word of engagement and the different ways in which engagements can be uh, declined and then the non-formality of education education that can be taken at really a different level of, uh, um, of the set. So uh, firstly, I would like to give a look to the uh, partnership of the project. So if you can uh, go ahead, thank you for the change of slides. So 
as you can see, Bispetativ actually um, is uh, quite uh, a big network because it involves 19 partners based in 15 different countries in Europe. And um, the interesting aspect is uh, that the different partners are very different one from each other. Of course, they are association, independent organization, uh, institutions, um, municipalities, and all of them are in actively involved in the, in the cultural field. So providing, of course, um, uh, um, at the, and contributing in the in the creation and the production of uh, of artistic experiences in at the daily local level um, through uh, international cooperations and collaborations. Uh, in the team, we have also two universities and one research center who are uh, crucial in the development, of course, of all the, uh, the research process, uh, which is uh, a backbone of, um, of the project. Um, uh, the, the main topics and the main contents on which we work are performing arts, so theater, dance, but also Nouveau Cirque. And, uh, and really the different of scales of uh, the different partners, that's a very important contribution in, uh, in understanding the complexity of the production, but also the way in which we enter in the different local context. So secondly, looking at artistic space, so next slide, please, thank you. Um, uh, here you see, you know, one of the main activities that are really linked on this idea of engagement and cultural participation. So the different co that characterize be spectacular. So um, according to the rule of the Arctic spectators, for us, uh, co-programming is uh, quite a crucial activity, which means that in each of the artistic venues, we have created since um, 2014, local groups of citizens, which contribute and collaborate to the artistic direction of the different places in uh, nourishing and in creating part of uh, uh, the art programs, which means bringing behaviors, values, differences. And of course, what is also interesting for us is uh, that each of the venue, uh, according to the um, different approaches, they are using different techniques for creating this process, this year process that um, every um, time creates some novelties and some uh, different entrances in, um, into, the, into the context. Secondly, we co-produce among the partners. So the partners collaborate for individuating artists and then defining processes. And how we do that, we have a design and a extensive um, co-creation approach, which means that to the artists, we ask to produce their activities uh, through an extensive um, residency program that as you can imagine now it's quite difficult to to realize according to the huge limitation of mobility that we are all living um, and uh, uh, to them is us to create interactions with the local networks and with the uh, local communities, uh, not necessarily to involve them in their production, but so in the sense of community art, but um, uh, according to, you know, uh, the idea of nourishing their research approaches that for us is quite crucial. So it's really up to the artists on how to create connection with the, with the local networks. And then uh, finally, um, one of the pilot experiences that we are actually um, conducting the frame of the second edition of this perspective is uh, this form of co-commissioning. So according to the work of the different uh, communities, what we are doing is to connect to different communities, asking them to work together, individuating which are the main issues on which they are working, which are the difficulties, problems uh, that they are facing, trying to find a common terrain. And uh, from there um, to uh, be the commissioner of a proper art project that can be realized in uh, both the localities. So this is, of course, a process that takes one year. Um, and it's really uh, introducing many novelties in this connection between uh, the artists, the organizations, and uh, the, local, uh, the local networks with which we are working quite a lot. So as you can imagine, the project is really focused on mobility. And as I was saying, this is uh, one of the um, 
huge limits that we are facing nowadays as most of the cooperation projects that are uh, of course based on mobility and of course the online that was already part of uh, our activities is helping us in taking in contact the different communities and also in taking all of us in contact in thinking and rethinking what are uh, the activities um, uh, crucial for, for the development of our project, also in the light of sustainability, which is one of the, the important topics that we are all tackling nowadays. Um, another aspect that I would like to underline is that um, according to all the activities that you are conducting, what we are doing is really to foster uh, exchanges at different level. So, which means uh, exchanges, exchanges between artist spectators, as I was saying, or artists and local citizens, uh, local groups of, um, uh, uh, of spectators, then uh, between the partners and the local communities, so their local communities, and then of course between the partners, so in the frame of the network, and then between the local groups of spectators, because again, the online since the beginning in 2014, for us was used for exchange experiences between the different groups of local spectators. Also through, uh, let's say, uh, gatherings, events. Uh, for example, we have this uh, European Spectator Day that every year um, is a moment in which different local communities exchange experiences and they have uh, uh, a moment of gathering. So of course time, as also you, Stefan, were mentioning, is crucial. And especially the second edition was built on the need of the communities, of the partners, but also the artists to have time for developing their activities and also for nourishing the different relations that we are activating again in this uh, translocal perspective. So across local uh, communities and not necessarily across uh, regions or nations, you know, which are almost and always more different. So all these things uh, brings me to arrive to the uh, to the topic of education as uh, an informal process as we see it in the frame of respect active. So uh, next slide, please. Um, which means uh, for us to define ourselves as a peer learning network. And uh, this approach was uh, more than ever clear uh, from 2018. So when we started with uh, our second edition with, uh, um, um, again, a second, uh, um, a second development of, uh, of the project, so with other four years of uh, experimentation. Uh, so what does it mean? Of course, firstly, uh, all taking care of all these relations at different level, as I was explaining you before. Um, but in concrete, also for us, it means to uh, foster education, in our case, understood as an informal process of empowerment of the different actors directly or indirectly reached by our activities. And um, this is strongly characterized for be uh, really horizontal in, a, in an horizontal uh, process. So in concrete, what we do and how we have tackled this topic. Firstly, we have individuated uh, um, this uh, figure, the community manager, in each of the different artistic venues. So the community manager is a key entrance in the local context. So is the person that um, support the artist in uh, funding the different local networks, which can be crucial for nourishing their experiences, or is um, the person uh, that uh, shares experiences with other community managers about uh, the difficulties of the co-programming or, uh, you know, the different uh, processes of uh, engagement into the different activities. So to the community manager since 2018, so since the beginning of the second edition, um, led by the research team, um, a, a proper training was addressed to them, uh, in which the aim was to create a common glossary of practices. So this is really goes in the direction of uh, creating an, uh, a common understanding of some keywords that are very used in different local contexts, but very often they not respond to the same practices. So for us, that was um, quite important. And then also, it was also a way for sharing the understandings of engagement 
uh, at the local level. Then secondly, we have developed and, uh, and this is still under construction, but it's uh, quite crucial nowadays for us. Uh, this is an internal qualitative evaluation, which means that inspired by uh, an appreciative approach, uh, what we do is uh, an evaluation of all the artistic activities uh, that we produce in the frame of the network. So, which means that we um, have gatherings of uh, together with uh, the artist. Uh, with the partners, with the representatives of local communities that were touched by um, this specific activity. And of that, we observed the process. So the different failure, the different successes that were reached, but also the failures, but also the emotions. So how the different people that were interacting and participating in it uh, were feeling themselves and, uh, and, and then trying to really develop a critical understanding together about the different uh, perspectives. And then finally, the action research. So let's say that the action research is um, a proper silent backbone of, uh, of the project, uh, because as is uh, very um, uh, typical of the action research process, um, all the, 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 the fundings and also the observation uh, conducted in the frame of the project are reproposing an itinerary. So it's really a kind of dynamic process of evaluation that is uh, that have really yeah, that was really useful and helpful for the network for understanding criticalities and also uh, goals that were reached at different levels so at the local level in the artistic context in the organizational side so how the different organizations have changed according to all these different levels of um, engagement so just to conclude let's say that um, again i would like to stress this idea of uh, uh, informal and horizontal process in uh, um, this exchange between uh, the different layers of, um, of our project. And there's also um, Luisella Carnelio Fitzcarraldo yesterday was uh, uh, rapidly uh, mentioning in the, in the panel about cultural participation and measurement. Um, it, it's, it's true that what we are doing is really uh, to be focused uh, on uh, um, the relation and now this relation can be deepened and also what is the intensity of the relations at the different level that we are generating and um, this is a very interesting key for understanding the changes but is also a very interesting strategy uh, for taking alive the community also in moments of crisis like the one that we are all living. Uh, uh, so I, I think that this is um, one of the things that we need to consider when we speak about cultural participation, engagement, and, uh, and also um, an informal process uh, of exchange between uh, between peers. With the last slides, I just would like to present a few numbers as uh, we all produce in uh, in the frame of the different projects. So, yeah, you see, uh, in uh, for the in these four years of uh, second edition, uh, we are selecting around two thousand two hundred uh, uh, twenty two performances selected by the spectators across Europe. And as you may so, we have uh, quite a broad, uh, a broad uh, network in many countries involved in it, many cities and local communities involved in it. We produce 15 uh, uh, productions, as uh, um, I was mentioning, through specific process, as uh, I was saying. About 60 residences will be realized, and already some of them are realized. Others will be online. Others will have a more hybrid form. Uh, and then, of course, international conferences, the European Spectator Day, which is uh, quite crucial nowadays for creating this connection between uh, the 15 local communities spread in Europe, and then other activities that are also reflecting on the fact of the different targets that the project is trying to, um, to tackle. So uh, not only let's say experts or um, uh, 
already um, informed uh, targets, but also uh, youngsters through the use of uh, social networks. Um, so that's it. You can find many information also on our website where different publications were realized, observing critically all these different aspects. And um, yeah, so that's it for me now. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Juliana. And um, I know it must be very complex uh, to manage across so many different uh, entities, but I really love the translocal which I think is uh, very important because we really want to accent the local embeddedness with a community, but the exposure and access uh, globally. So, so uh, I love that. Um, maybe before we open up to the general questions and I ask all of our panelists to take a peek in the Q&A section at some of the questions that have come up, but Juliana, is there, could you give us a, a, maybe just one example of one of the, um, one of the events um, that you have just to give a little bit of a flavor to the audience of um, the kinds of, uh, events and projects part of the part of the numbers that you just showed on that last slide yeah 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 of course um yeah let's say one of the the, the latest event that we have produced here now in the moment of a huge crisis as i was mentioning is the european spectator day which is a, a fancy idea uh, but at the same time is quite very effective and it's really linked to this idea of translocal uh, because basically the, the, the main topic for us was how to create a connection between these different local communities that for all the year they work together, um, they work in their context, uh, elaborating, looking performances, selecting performances together with the TC directors and whatever. So basically the idea was to create a moment, a gathering, uh, in which they all can express uh, the difficulties and the also artistic experience from their perspectives. So um, at the end, what we thought was to create a Facebook event at the beginning in which all of them, they were connected and uh, discussed different topics, answering to specific questions. I remember, for example, one of the European spectator data that was uh, quite uh, strong was uh, after the um, uh, terrorist attack in Brussels. Uh, so in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, um, in which the debate was really on the, the meaning of this practice in a moment in which we were really under attack of, uh, and then we were feeling the fear, no? And it was interesting because we had the collaboration of also other um, European cooperation projects that were uh, collaborating with us, bringing also the community. So it was really a kind of moment in which uh, the discussion was taking place. So actually what we have done for improving this kind of practice was to invite artists and design the format of interaction. Because of course it was an empirical exploration. So step by step we have discovered that it's very interesting also to create connection with different uh, perspectives. Or for example, another, um, another thing that is uh, uh, interesting to serve is the way in which we produce. One of the latest production that we uh, the latest two productions that we uh, have seen are um, one that was uh, um, the title was uh, Body of Knowledge and uh, the director is uh, Samara Hersh, she is uh, a director from Australia and again uh, the, the format, the idea of giving time was really linked to the fact to offer to the artist uh, four residences in uh, four different contexts uh, in which they, as I was saying before, nourish their artistic practices. So in the case of Samara, for example, she was really working on uh, this idea of teenagers and uh, their connection with um, their body. So basically she was creating a community of teenagers that were connected by phone and they and the, the performance uh, which is really well done and very well uh, uh, built also according to the social emotions that were discussed before um, the, the, um, the, the teenagers they uh, called the different participants to the performance asking them very also heavy questions so how they have to deal with uh, maybe racist problems or uh, in topics of gender transition 
or, you know, so really the variety of topics that teenagers are facing and which our world is uh, as adults, very often it's uh, quite far, no, because are uh, sold in a different way. So the process that she was developing in the different contexts was, of course, having some workshops together with the teenagers, but also in understanding the cultural um, perspectives that were coming from the four different contexts. Uh, and for us, it was also very important to support a previous research for her that is always something that in the artist, research, artist practices and art production, we uh, don't allow uh, because we don't have time, because we don't have money for that. And that was also quite important for, for her. So she had the opportunity really to explore the topic, understanding the difficulties, and then realizing the project. So um, this is one of the things that we have realized. So, yeah. Great, thanks, Juliana. It gives us a, a nice flavor. And again, I think also the, the youth angle for engagement, education, and also with the concerns with COVID and what that will mean for this next generation in terms of their other opportunities, how to keep them engaged in positive activities through cultural participation as well. Um, so uh, just to, for the panelists, I see we have a, a few questions and comments here. Um, and so for all participants, uh, you'll see some links in the chat function uh, from uh, follow up on Stefan's presentation. Uh, for, the, uh, for the panelists, it, just if you're aware of any educational toolkits to help overcome the digital divide. Um, and if, I guess more for, I guess, Ava on this question, how Corona has maybe changed your workflow. Oh, um, I was thinking um, of responding to Juliana's mm -hmm. um, uh, sure. Presentation a little bit. I don't know. Um, I was focusing on 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 that, but and I kindly kind of already responded to that uh, workflow thing in a way. Uh, just quickly, I think um, I feel it's it's increased work. Corona. It's it takes takes uh, a toll on 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 your um, takes a toll on your time. In it takes a toll on on. On, on on the on the body too and and it, it is very important for everyone in during these times to really take care of oneself and each other and and to to be gentle on 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 your body mind system and and really really walk outside and breathe and do a lot of maybe gentle practices and and all that so i would just really emphasize that and because it's 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 very um very concrete uh, consequence of this situation is that we we uh, suffer uh, probably uh, holistically the well-being uh, with being secluded and and more enclosed um, but there are ways several ways as we have heard today to overcome the this uh, Social distance, and that's most imp most important, of course, with the with the uh, holidays approaching. How we really need to reach out to those who are alone and lonely. And art is really, really a wonderful way to to give comfort to to people. To remind that not all things are are the most important things in life are not uh, material; they are immaterial, like. Um, artistic experiences and social uh, connections, immateriality in those is, is most valuable in these times. Uh, and of course, it's not equal for everyone to, to be um, able to, to reach to all, all these um, events that are online. Uh, we have differences in, 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 uh, in internet connections and, and not every, every child, every youth can reach reach to these wonderful online uh, resources but uh, whoever is responsible for of the listeners of, of of making this more possible for everyone to to have access to these wonderful resources cultural and, and artistic and educational resources that are there there are so many many there so, so just to let people know, let, let children, youngsters, teachers know about these resources, 
uh, communicate about uh, how to use them and all that. It's most important, I think, during these times. And I just wanted to say in response to Juliana that uh, uh, it's wonderful what you do in, in um, crossing through uh, across sectors, soci societal sectors, that that needs to happen much more connections uh, between educational and cultural sectors in, in, in society and um, there they are often uh, in silos uh, they, they're separate different agents who who really organize events and organize education and um, these need to find more collaboration as you are doing a great example in in arts equal research initiative that we have been working uh, with for over five years. Uh, we have uh, tried to emphasize this cross-sectoral collaboration in arts and cultural services so that we need to bring arts artists and art events to schools and also to take school, school pupils, students to cultural uh, events. Both things are needed and um, collaboration is the key. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Eva. Um, we're getting near our close. So Stefan, if you have any final comments you wanted to, to flag before we uh, head to our closing? Yeah, perhaps actually one quick uh, uh, answer and actually building on what Eva just said, you know, on the digital toolkits and uh, of resources is that uh, one thing we've observed and that was in a sense a very positive thing during the, the COVID crisis is that all governments and everywhere have actually Put together a lot of digital resources for everyone to use uh, from worksheets you know for those who don't have access to the internet um, tv radio you know so i work on ai and this kind of thing so you know it was interesting to see that the older technologies uh, were also mobilized to to uh, a lot of educational resources, banks of educational resources. And in fact, one of the problem was exactly what Eva said, you know, the question of the use. So how do you actually make a good use of that? Because just being surrounded by resources is not enough to actually make a, a, a good use of it. And so that was nonetheless a problem. What we can say that in terms of accessing these things, actually uh, a lot was done. And same for actually uh, lending equipment to people making connectivity uh, easier. But you know what everybody expects is that nonetheless, we will see that there was some digital divide. And actually the question of the digital divide has become much, much, much stronger in education and, and the awareness of it has become much, much stronger than it was before uh, uh, the crisis for sure. And perhaps one last comment and on Juliana's uh, presentation and, and work and, and also on the, the comment from uh, the Irish colleagues, you know, doing this uh, wonderful creative island and Wales also had a large program on, on creative schools and, and Scotland had one and that. So, you know, there is a lot of things going on everywhere. And just to mention that it's also a process, you know, all this work on creativity and the arts, it's, it's really bringing its social processes and there are a lot of different ways to, to do it. One thing I wanted to mention, in fact, you know, it's how, uh, and the, the, you know, one, because Creative Island, as well as Wales, you know, they use this uh, uh, model of uh, creative partnerships, which was actually uh, uh, developed in England by uh, Creativity, Culture and Education. And what they do basically is that they make creative agents work with schools and teachers to develop activities. And so it's an interesting way to also think of, you know, the relationship between the cultural sector and, uh, you know, the education sector, how uh, without transforming the creative agents or the you know, artists into teachers, how they can actually help to provide more creative processes, creative education within schools through different types of connections and, 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 and collaboration. And so I think there are a lot of interesting models that can still be uh, explored uh, on that. Great, thanks, Stefan. Um, and thank you again to uh, Eva, Juliana, and Stefan for this really uh, exciting talk that uh, literally we didn't see the time uh, go by. We're gonna now head to um, to close. And I'd like to uh, just thank again also the European Commission with whom we're uh, 
producing these policy seminars and a report that uh, will also capture some of the lessons from these uh, different discussions over the last few days. So if I could ask uh, Mache Hoffman, uh, I think you wanted to help us close uh, today's seminar. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. Can you hear me and see me well? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, indeed, I wanted to, to, to say a few words to you on behalf of the, the European Commission, uh, the partner of OECD for this event. Uh, and first of all, of course, thank you very much for these days of, uh, of very intense and interesting exchanges. These were very busy days for all of us, I think, with a lot of involvement and questions coming from all sides. Um, as you have just said, it's been a translocal event in a way too, actually, because we're connecting these different perspectives. And this is very important, I think, for for, for building uh, this community of practice that we have also mentioned on several occasions, reaching out to partners locally, regionally, nationally, um, also reaching out to, to partners and networks from the European level, but the global level. So this is a, this is a huge added value, of course, of, of such events. Uh, I'm also very happy that we are building a community of practice between the European Commission and OECD, because I can find a lot of ways in which our ways of thinking are together. We are all trying to, 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 to bridge the gaps, to, to bring down the silos and also mainstream culture in a way uh, in many of our reflections that we have actually. So of course, looking at culture for, for its value, intrinsic value, but also in ways in which uh, it can fuel and, and link to different, different policy areas, link to economy, to social inclusion and cohesion, to education and so on. So I'm very happy for, for this. Uh, we'll have to look now for ways i think to also share a lot of uh, a lot of this knowledge so you know the all different links and initiatives that were shared throughout q and a's in the chat so this will be i guess for, for 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 us and for oecd to find the good ways to to share it with you of course we wish we could have met in person and it was not made possible because of COVID. because the initial idea for the project was indeed to have uh, to have physical conferences we had to experiment a bit with the with the format but i think it was so far so good successful and the, we did not actually end here, so this is just the first step in the project. So I'm very happy now to hand over to OECD and Katya to, to tell you more about the, the next steps for the project. And thank you very much for, for your involvement and your hard work on, on this project. Well, thank you so much, Mache. And yes, so one done, three to go. Uh, but I was uh, really wanting to thank all our speakers for the last uh, three days for fantastic discussions and a lot of uh, food for thought and a lot of information. So thank you to the speakers and thank you also to our participants or attendees, as uh, they say in Zoom. So what's next now? Uh, we'll continue with this policy webinars and we have quite a rich agenda ahead of us. Uh, uh, so already next year in January, at the end of January, we'll have a session on jobs in the creative sectors. So how you support them and what's happening with them now, etc. And a spotlight session on, on uh, COVID-19 and music like we did one on festivals. And then, uh, and, and this um, um, webinar at the end of January will be uh, co-hosted, but by one of our partner regions, uh, it's Scotland and uh, um, Glasgow city region. And then at the end of February, we'll go well virtually <laughs> to Flanders, and we'll uh, organize uh, a webinar on SME support ecosystems. And then at the end of March, or maybe beginning of April, we'll have another webinar on innovation in public and private investment in arts and culture. So with this, uh, I would like to thank you all uh, really heartfully uh, and look forward to seeing you probably in the next year and we'll see our member uh, regions uh, at 2 o'clock today. Thank you so much. <laughs>